following on from a project we had called Transit Labor is called uh, Logistical Worlds. And I have a few of these um, pamphlet newspapers that some of you may want to collect after this. And the game we've developed is made within the context uh, political interests, intellectual kind of um, uh, techniques and methods that we're interested in bringing to this topic of uh, global logistics industries where we see um, uh, the intersection between software infrastructure and labor as it relates to uh, China-led globalization. So if you like, we're looking at indexing imperial power through infrastructure uh, in shipping ports, in um, railway um, uh, extensions, in intermodal terminals, uh, in warehousing. And to ask the question, how does the intersection between infrastructure and software uh, give us some indication of the type of uh, transformation uh, and movement of these techniques of governance uh, across a range of institutional settings. And so we begin with the idea of focusing on the center of power, um, uh, the kind of software systems that um, don't appear in, as far as I'm too aware, in most studies of um, so-called software studies. Um, uh, and they're extremely inaccessible, right, because of the enormous cost of development. The implementation is in the millions of dollars. Many of you actually may be using these techno uh, softwares in your um, workplace settings. Um, and the type of uh, data economy derived um, from um, the production of value as a result of the intersection between labor and interface uh, is another matter of investigation altogether. Um, but in terms of the particular project around the game that we've developed here uh, called Cargonauts, um, uh, which is not appearing on the screen, um, um, I'm not sure why. Um, uh, we've located this <coughs> game uh, developed by the artists and uh, game designers um, uh, Ilias Mamaras and Anna Lascari, um, who we have here. Um, uh, to start to kind of indicate, you know, the relationship between um, uh, the, the kind of labor conditions going on uh, through the privatization of a port within Athens called um, Piraeus, um, and um, the type of subjectivities that emerge as a consequence of the presence of this infrastructure. Um, so the game itself... Um, This is when you test stuff initially and it doesn't work again, right? Um, sorry, this is still not coming up. Can I please have some help? Yeah, I wanted to um, say a few points, though, about this question of um, the role of gameplay and development vis-a-vis uh, -vis a kind of strategy, if you like, of um, intervention, of refusal, resistance, these types of terms uh, that can be tested within the space of the game and then translated into um, so-called, you know, non-gamified spaces. Can I say a few things along these lines? Yeah, because, you know, there's um, kind of a lot of talk we're finding um, around the idea that there is no longer a distinction to be drawn between this game, the game, the world of the game, right, and um, the so-called um, world we have that is not gamified, right? Uh, I noticed this particularly in, in the interview that Mackenzie Walk has made in preparation for the talk he'll give here in the next day or two, uh, where, you know, he draws on this um, text by Emmanuel uh, Mierberg in Sim City Homelessness is a Bug or a Feature. Uh, and, you know, we're sort of seeing these statements along the lines that the game is this optimized neoliberal world, right? Uh, if we want to see what neoliberalism looks like, let's look at the game. Uh, work out how to tinker within that space, and then we can kind of function uh, ex in, in the sort of external spaces, right? Translate it back. Re-engineer, if you like. So I think this is a massive analytical, political kind of mistake, uh, I've got to say, 
um, because let's face it, um, uh, you try and play your gamified techniques in your institutional settings, uh, your social lives, and you'll quickly see they're probably not going to work too well, right? And why is that? Because um, actually the world is much more complicated and complex than the world of the game, right? Um, uh, no matter that you sort of start to see increasing techniques of, you know, so-called gamification, right, in a range of workplace settings to kind of optimise productivity and performance uh, from labour, to extract kind of further uh, value from labour, to kind of make labour fun, okay? Uh, I, I just think this is a really crazy kind of line of thought to go down. Um, and in fact, you know, the challenge is, um, uh, I think, to see how we can kind of operate in interventionist ways um, that uh, have probably not a lot to do with the game at all. Um, so I think that then uh, limits the extent to which we can start valorizing the space of the game as a medium through which um, uh, other kinds of political intervention may be possible. Now, I guess this could be kind of a disagreeable point, um, but we'll see, right? Um, uh, you know, having said that, you know, one of the readings that we had in this preparation was something by Yokoi um, on um, algorithmic catastrophe, right? Um, and he was interested in, you know, how is it that this idea of an algorithmic catastrophe um, corresponds with this um, a sort of accident with a c contingency um, that's sort of a result of, I don't know, this idea of exteriorized region, reason. I found that a little bit kind of complicated, but, you know, in a sense, how can the kind of perhaps catastrophe be orchestrated? You know, this might then become a, a political strategy, the orchestration of catastrophe. Um, and maybe this is where games become kind of interesting because we sort of play the kind of, if you like, the politics of parameters within the space of the game. Uh, I think this is where game design becomes, you know, fascinating, the, the selection of parameters through which expression action, uh, concept production, uh, research method uh, may be possible, um, offers a kind of different set of material um, mediated media kind of coordinates through which uh, expression, you know, is possible. Um, uh, because, you know, certainly it's the case, right? It seems that much of the, if you like, the ways in which urban space is designed and modelled is increasingly, you could say, uh, a result of the kind of um, gamification processes and um, logics. I mean, it seems that, um, you know, SimCity may be one of these kind of games, right? Um, um, yeah, but I th again, I think we just need to be kind of cautious of the extent to which we wish to um, uh, say there is no distinction then um, between these different kinds of spaces. Um, uh, which is to sort of make, a, again, a mistake around what is the material form that we're engaging with, what is the technical form um, that we're, we're engaging with. Um, uh, so, yeah, nevertheless, right, I think, you know, parameters are the sort of site of um, uh, activist intervention and, and invention um, at a certain level. Uh, in terms of this um, game that we've designed here, um, this, um, I've got to say, um, is um, very much in uh, beta mode, uh, in demo mode, right? Um, uh, you can download it from the website, cargonauts.net, um, onto different kind of um, uh, phone platforms. Um, um, I think it's an attempt to kind of make visible um, a very different representational style to, to your game, enormously different, right? Um, so it's fascinating to see how you've kind of dealt with um, a political space uh, within your game, I find. And, and this is um, operating in this sort of verisimilitude kind of way, right? Um, and again, you know, the crucial decision around um, uh, software and design that you bring to your kind of object of research and intervention is, is a very uh, kind of obviously critical one to make. Um, um, uh, what can I sort of end with? Um, I'm lost. You want to push me somewhere? <laughs> I can push you. Uh, no, I th think that's interesting that you say about the different aesthetic styles of these two games, which is quite apparent, but I also sense a style and attitude in between the two games. And that was one of the reasons why Daphne and I thought it would be interesting to have you on 
one panel because with uh, Christian and uh, Vladan, I sense something like a professional pessimism up to a black humor uh, statement of, well, we are fucked anyway. Well, we can just see how the algorithmic system kills the world and watch it and, and have fun in watching it, almost like a cynical standpoint. Wherein, whereas um, Nat's uh, attitude seems to be to me that you have a critical um, uh, view with a wink in the eye and a spoonful of optimism that says, well, how can we get out of there? How can we escape from a fully um, algorithmic system that according to Yuk would lead to an algorithmic catastrophe? The system would, by the inherent logic of an algorithmic system, destroy itself and with itself, probably us. But you have this spoonful of hope and in our discussions via email, you once said, and I was quite surprised about that statement, your um, rescue anchor from the algorithmic um, automatism of destruction would maybe not be playfulness, which most game designers would hope for, that this is the rescue anchor, how we escape it, but it would be joy. So what do you mean by joy? How can joy rescue us from, from the... Orwellian totalitarian. Yeah, as soon as I sort of mentioned that, I regretted it because all these other folks in the conversation just came on and started beating me up over it. That, oh, wow, I've dug myself a big hole here. One of these things I wish I'd never said. Um, but I guess my kind of point of departure, whether joy is the term or not, was to think um, the relationship between play and exploitation, um, uh, which is obviously apparent in the kind of um, uh, discourse and institutional practice of gamification. Uh, it rests upon the exploitation of playfulness. Um, and, you know, there's such a kind of limited horizon of parametric intervention within gamification that you certainly might as well give up, right, and, and watch it all melt down in some way, except you won't even get the chance because those buttons don't exist for you. Um, so you can certainly end up in kind of pessimism for sure. Um, uh, I guess then also it was a question of around moving it, uh, across different sort of global spaces over the last um, time and getting depressed in different kind of settings. Um, Sydney is filled with people loaded on crack trying to kill you, um, quite, you know, on the roads. It's uh, kind of certainly a game there, um, but you're going to come out bloody. Um, uh, you know, Hong Kong, kind of, um, I found another mesh world. Um, uh, you know, London is this sort of mesh world. And then I was in Chile recently. I thought, ah, yeah, no, this is amazing, okay? This is the center laboratory of um, the neoliberal experiment under the dictatorship there. Uh, clearly it's failed. Um, uh, and, you know, there is possibility for life that isn't caught up in the mesh world um, to the extent that you feel in many European spaces, uh, North American spaces, uh, East Asian spaces. Um, and so when you feel like your life has indeed become uh, coordinated through the algorithmic apparatus, and its techniques of extracting value for the purposes of capital accumulation, blah, 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 um, it's easy to get depressed. Um, uh, and indeed, we have this default, I think, intellectually, uh, of making the kind of uh, mistake of um, seeing the particular as generalizable. I know I, I do it all of the time. Um, uh, you know, how else do we make sense of our world, right? Um, uh, but then, you know, I think it's in moving across different kind of spaces that aren't yet kind of subject to the kind of um, uh, algorithmic power of capital and its various kind of um, techniques of capture, let's say, uh, that you see other kind of lines of possibility that um, are yet to kind of find expropriation. Um, uh, and, and, you know, within these spaces, uh, we realize that the game is not the kind of perfection of a certain neoliberalism, but that indeed neoliberalism perhaps isn't as ubiquitous as we tend to think. Yeah. But then, like, uh, I think that we should, like, uh, agree or, like, agree that we don't have specific definition of what is game. Because, like, when you say game, it's so different things. It's so many layers. Like, uh, it, there are so many games, actually. And even like if you say world, it's kind of those like what, what is world and for who? Like if you like uh, think about, I don't know, like from, from my grandma, the, the, the concept of world was much more smaller than for example like uh, contem certain contemporary games in terms of uh, complex algorithms that like you need to operate like simultaneously. So it's like, uh, that's like there are different games and there are different worlds mm -hmm. also. And... Um, 
And, and regarding this, kind, this, uh, uh, this, this calculation of, of, of play, I think it's the best, uh, um, in a way, example is free-to-play gaming now. Because free-to-play games, it, it's, it's like, like the plastic example of, of uh, a real-time calculation of individual and group behavior online. Because you have uh, huge and like a, like a um, bigger and bigger um, game analytics departments in the game companies that is like uh, following uh, the the activities of the players inside of the game. And upon these activities, they're going. They can come completely to individual or to certain group groups. That they, can, they can extract, and then they can change the game according to this behavior. And most of these games are basically endless games. There, are, there is no end un until like you really start to develop the game. So, and the, it's like typical like feedback uh, uh, dream of cybernetics in a way, like like feedback mechanism in, in, in this free-to-play gaming. Feedback mechanism and maybe also a, a surveillance aspect in it with these free-to-play games that almost all the time transform your information to someone. So uh, 